Recently, I've had some not so pleasant experiences at the gas pump, just sort of gritting my teeth as I watch the amount keep rising. I'm sure you can all relate. Inflation is hitting us all where it really hurts and dang does it hurt. But recently I learned about a simple app that can help ease the pain a little bit. Upside. Upside is an incredible application for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I've been trying not to eat out as much because I've noticed how prices keep steadily creeping up over time. But when I'm getting cash back with Upside, it really helps me justify having a night out for myself every once in a while. And it's so simple too. You just claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside, check it in at the business, pay as you usually would with a credit or debit card and then get cash back. It sounds too good to be true but I've used it and this thing really works. Download the free Upside app and use promo code Mr. Creeps to get 5 bucks or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code Mr. Creeps. We were never a very religious family. My grandmother was though and through her is where my family got our second hand religion. She lived with us for the last four years of her life, and I know that I owe my own life to her. Had it not been for her constant teachings, I'd be dead. I know that as strongly as I know my own name, I tried to tune her out, like my parents and brother would do. But what little bits I was able to retain stuck, dug deep into my soul waiting for the day that I would need them. I never would have believed that I would ever need them, certainly not at the age of 20. It's been a year since it happened, and while the few of us that have survived try and forget, I've not been so lucky in those attempts. It's not just the trauma or the memory of those three awful days. I don't think it's even the guilt of surviving when so many didn't. Although the memories and guilt are still there, still fresh like a burn that hasn't healed. No, I think more than anything it's the knowledge that it all will happen again, and this time it will happen on a larger scale, in a place much larger than my own town, with a meager population of 1,307. Next time, it may be the world. They'd called it a freak occurrence. Occurrence. That word suggests something average, something still normal. This was nothing like normal. This was a nightmare. But occurrence was the word they used. A freak accident. They used that word too. An act of God. A CO2 was the culprit, they had told us. A deadly cloud of CO2 that had built up in the bottom of our lake. That deadly cloud was responsible for the deaths of 1,289 people, men, women, and many children. There were just 18 survivors, only one of which was a child. 18. We didn't even fill the bus that was used to transport us out of town, away from our home, our families, and our lives, away from the bodies that still littered the streets and fields as we drove by the many that had gone outside, possibly for help. For those of us who experienced it, the CO2 theory was a bit hard to swallow. It was worse than that. It enraged us. It was a laughable excuse, one made to quiet the media, to quiet any fears and prevent hysteria. We tried to argue against their claim, but our accounts were quickly written off as effects of the gas. How could a single town be covered in darkness when the rest of the world was still functioning as normal? No one would listen. So we all stopped talking. We were given money, a new place to live, but we know that doesn't matter where we go. It'll happen again. On a much larger scale than when it does. How many will be left then? I want to tell you my story. Not just to unload it off my conscience although that may help. My true motive is that maybe my story will help someone somewhere. Maybe a few someones. 
And they may just hear my story and like me when my grandmother's teachings, they might just retain it and keep it for the day that their world goes black and demons walk the earth. It all went dark one morning in June. I was living with my brother and a friend of ours and we were all quickly shoveling cereal into our mouths before we went our separate ways to work. One second I was staring into the colorful mess of my fruity pebbles and the next, darkness. The kind of dark that makes you wonder if you suddenly and inexplicably went blind. And that's exactly what I thought. I dropped my bowl, hearing the crack of the glass on the countertop and the feel of cold milk running down my legs. And I could do nothing else but stare. In a cold fear like I hadn't felt since I was a 12 year old and I had almost choked on a gumball. I brought my hands to my eyes and waved them, frantically rubbed them, opened and closed them, as though these things would somehow cure my blindness. Yes, I thought that I had gone blind. That is, until I heard my brother Aiden cry out, followed by his own bowl of cereal crashing to the floor. This was immediately preceded by Kyle, screaming in more shattered glass. The first few minutes after it went dark was chaos. Screaming panic, bumping into things and knocking them over. Obscenities hurled out into the void. No real coherent thought entered my mind then. It was all madness, terror. Were we dying? I waited to feel my air cut off or the loss of my ability to stand to move. But it never came. Only the darkness. So thick and black that it almost felt as though I could reach out and touch it. Feel it on my fingers like velvet. Before that day, I never realized that I had never actually seen darkness. Not truly. No matter how dark you are imagining, it was so much worse. I was pressed up against the living room wall for the first few minutes, desperately trying to see anything, and seeing nothing but the void. I heard my brother and Kyle screaming, colliding with furniture and sobbing. Faintly, I could even hear screams from outside, explosions in the distance. Still, somehow in all that noise and fear and chaos, I heard my grandmother's voice. Not out loud and not in my head, but a memory of her voice. Somehow, it reached me at that moment, like a lifeline. It was a memory of my grandmother in her bed her precious Bible on her lap, the room smelling a gentle mix of her face cream and peppermint candies. I was 17 and painting her fingernails hot pink while she talked about God and heaven. I was doing my best to tune her out when she had stopped speaking and gripped my hand. It had been so sudden, so unexpected that I almost dropped the bottle of polish on her bed. Emmy, listen now because this is important. She had said. She had been getting sicker. The cancer had made it to her spine, her legs and lungs. But not her brain. Not yet. But for a split second, I thought it had. But the clarity in her gray eyes, the strength in her grip, and the urgency in her tone pushed that worry from my mind. There will come a day, likely not too far from this one, that you may experience something terrible. There will come a blackness to the earth, a darkness so profound that any who look upon it shall tear out their eyes and die. It will last for three days, less a night. During that time, you must not go outside, nor must you look outside. Stay away from the doors and windows. Cover the windows and lock all doors immediately. You must not speak to anyone outside. The demons will try to trick you. They can mimic voices. They will try to lure you out. You must not fall for these tricks. There will be no light. The only light will come from blessed candles. One will be enough to last the duration, and it will not go out. Not even if the house should fall down around it. During these days you must pray and ask for forgiveness, and pray for the souls on the earth to be spared. 
many will die. Use holy water, pray, and by God do not go outside. She said these things seemingly in one breath, a feat not easy for her at the time when saying more than a sentence meant having to stop and catch her precious breath. When she had finished, she released my hand and looked down at her fingernails and smiled. What a lovely job you've done. Can you get my water, Em? My mouth is very dry all of a sudden. And that was it. For days, weeks even, I wondered if I had somehow imagined the entire thing. But a slight scratch in my hand from my grandmother's ring was proof that I had end. I slowly forgot about that conversation. But after her death, my mother gave me a box of my grandmother's things that she had wanted me to have. I kept it in the closet, though I honestly never believed that I would need them. I remember that day and my grandmother's warning with almost perfect clarity. It calmed me in that moment of total panic. I took a deep breath and still shaking, still blind. I called out to my brother and Kyle. It took more than a few tries of shouting their names before they finally stopped. It was Aiden who answered. His voice was trembling and breaking, as if he were on the edge of madness. I guess we all were. You need to stop and stand still, and I need you to listen to me, okay? I said, my own voice stronger and calmer than I felt. There was a moment of silence, except for their ragged brass and still the faint screams coming from somewhere outside. Were they closer now? I was about to speak again when he finally answered. Okay, he said. I could hear the desperation in his voice, like he was relying on me, his little sister, to somehow fix them all. Kyle, you too. Are you there? I asked, and I could hear him sniffling. Yeah, he half whispered. Okay, now I'm guessing that you both can't see. I can't either, but we're okay otherwise. I don't know for sure what's going on, but we have to try and calm down if we're going to figure it out, I said. Calm down, Kyle said, as if he couldn't understand how I could expect them to be calm. Em, we can't freaking see. I know that, but screaming about it isn't going to help. We need to. I started, but Kyle interrupted me. What we need to do is call the freaking ambulance, he shouted. I wanted to tell them that it wouldn't do any good, but I still didn't know yet. What I felt was that we were running out of time, as if somewhere an hourglass had been flipped, and the sand was falling much too fast. Come on, Kyle yelled, and something crashed across the room. There's no signal. Anybody got signal? His voice was dripping with desperation, just like Aiden's. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and despite feeling in my gut that there would be no signal, I tried. I tried because I was just as desperate for help as they were. Making a phone call, even one with just three numbers while blind, wasn't as easy as it sounds. I tried to remember where the phone icon was, tried to mentally recall where the 9 and one would be. I tried a dozen times or more, but it didn't work. I heard Aiden mutter the same, and once again, we were back at square one. And then a scream pierced the quiet. This one wasn't the faint screams from outside. This one was coming from Kyle's room. Oh crap, Kyle said. Jenna, I forgot she was here, he said. A second later, his bedroom door flung open and a crying Jenna stumbled down the hallway. When Kyle called her name and they found each other, through hitching sobs, she told them that she was blind. Something had happened to her eyes. It took a long time to calm her down, to explain that we were all blind. She was scared and she wanted to leave to call her father, but just like everybody else is, her phone had no signal. After a while, she was finally quiet, still crying, but softly. Alright guys, I know you're scared and so am I, but I feel like something bad is happening outside and if we don't secure the house, it's gonna get in, I said. 
Instantly, I pictured the face of a demon that I had seen in one of my grandmother's books, and I was filled with ice-cold terror. What the heck are you talking about? Kyle asked. What's going to get in? I don't know, but my grandmother warned me about this, said that it would happen one day. I never believed it, but I let out a shaky breath. And Kyle snorted. Oh, the Bible nut, he said. I felt my body tense. I wanted to slap him, but I probably wouldn't even be able to get to him without falling over the mess that they made. Watch your mouth, I said. She wasn't a nut. She might be right. So tell us, what did she say was happening? He snapped. Kyle, shut up and just do what she says. We got nothing else, Aiden said, finally breaking his silence. Em, tell us what you need us to do. I felt a brief moment of relief. I pushed myself away from the wall, standing on my own in the void, and said, Help me get to my room. I have to get something out of the closet. It took more than five minutes just to get to my bedroom. Traversing through the wreckage that was our living room was difficult, and we tripped more than once. But once I made it to my room, the closet was easy to get to, and the box marked with my name in red sharpie and my grandmother's handwriting was even easier to find. It was as if she were guiding me through the black, guiding my hand in hers like she had so many times before when she taught me to sew. I sat on the floor at the box in front of me, and I ripped the tape off. Inside was her Bible, her favorite passages marked, with notes scribbled on the margins. There was a cross, the one she always wore, three rosaries, all of them blessed, and the thing that I needed the most, what I had stumbled through the dark to find, a blessed beeswax candle. I gently lifted it from the box, carefully unwrapping it from the newspaper. Then we very carefully made our way back to the kitchen, where we capped the matches. I felt the matches touch my fingertips, and I ripped one out of the book and struck it, I felt the heat on my fingers and smelled the sulfur, but I saw no light. With trembling fingers, I felt the wick and slowly brought the match to it, my heart pounding so hard in my chest that I thought it might burst free. And just like that, just as sudden as the darkness came, there was light. I saw the face of my brother before me, his hair tousled and his shirt torn at the collar. He had a small cut over his eyebrow, and he looked very afraid. And Kyle was staring around the room at me, at the candle in my hand. Oh, thank God. Thank God, Aiden whispered. We're not blind, Kyle said stunned. No, we're not, I said, saying a silent prayer, grateful that this had worked. We could see. But that relief was immediately replaced by terror. That meant that this really was happening. It was coming. The light was bright, much stronger than a candle should be. It was like a beacon of hope. I set it up on our TV stand, yet somehow it lit the entire floor. We should go outside and... Kyle started, already moving towards the front door. I quickly grabbed him by the waist, wrapping both arms around him tightly. No... You can't go outside. No one can. Not until the sun comes up, I said. Em, what's happening? He said, turning to face me. I let him go and looked around the room, careful to avoid looking at the windows. We had blinds, but I didn't know if just looking through the thin slats was enough to kill you. Somehow, I thought it was. I looked at all of them, my own fear reflecting back at me from their faces and said, First, we have to cover the windows, all of them, and close your eyes when you do it. If you look, even by accident, you'll die. I don't know how, but you will. I thought that they would protest, call me crazy. But they all nodded, and together we gathered blankets and a hammer, and nails, and with our eyes shut tight, we covered every window. Afterwards, we locked the doors and used the sofa and Kyle's dresser to barricade them. I prayed that it would be enough. When we had finished, I told them everything that Grandma had told me. 
It was obvious that Kyle didn't believe a word, but Aiden did. I could see it on his face. Jenna just looked terrified and confused. We argued. Kyle thought that we needed to get out, get to a neighbor or something. But I was adamant that we were not opening that door. Not for anything. He thought taking a peek out of the window wouldn't hurt us. It couldn't hurt us. But it would. I knew it would. The one thing that we could agree on was staying together. We gathered our mattresses and made beds on the living room floor. We felt safer together. Time passed by. Hours, maybe a whole day. It was hard to tell without a way to gauge the time. Clocks didn't work anymore and with no sun or moon, it was like time no longer existed. We did have running water, though Jenna felt that we shouldn't drink it, thought that it could be contaminated. She was sure this whole thing was some kind of attack. Aiden read a book. Kyle tried to sleep. Jenna relentlessly tried to get through to anyone on her phone, trying even social media, every app. But none worked. She was getting more and more panicked about not reaching her father. It worried me. I knew that we would have to keep an eye on her. I held my grandmother's cross and I prayed. Sometime later came the screaming. A woman, and she sounded as if she were being torn apart. She sounded close, too close. And we all sat up and listened with fresh fear. The screaming seemed to go on forever. It sounded as if it were happening right out in front in the street. When it finally stopped, I tried to picture the woman who had made those screams. I wondered who she was, if I had seen her, maybe a neighbor. And then someone knocked, first on the front door, fast and loud, then on our front window, hard pounding like with a fist. I prayed the glass wouldn't crack. We all looked at the door with wide eyes, all of us praying that whoever it was would just go away. The knocking stopped after a few minutes, but we still waited, too afraid to speak. We all jumped when we heard the voice, so close to the front door that I couldn't help but picture something terrible, too terrible to even understand, standing on our porch with its lips pressed to the door as it spoke. So close it felt like it was inside with us. Hello, I know you're in there, I can see the light. A woman's voice. Was it the same woman? The screaming woman? Aiden shook his head at us and we all nodded. No one spoke. Please, it's dark. So dark out here. I saw your light, please just let me come in. I don't know what's going on. She said, pleading. We said nothing. Tension in the air so heavy it was hard to breathe. I felt guilty at the thought of leaving the woman out there in that darkness, but I remembered my grandmother's words and held tight to them. Why won't you answer? The woman begged, and she sounded as if she were crying. She knocked again, just one rap on the door, and then silence. We strained to hear if she went away. The only sounds that we could hear were our own panicked breathing. It took an hour or more for us to speak again. It was Kyle who spoke first. Think we should have let her in? He asked. No, I said quickly. We can't open that door for anyone. The demons will try to trick us. He scoffed. Demons, Em. Are you even hearing yourself? He asked. And Jenna began to cry. You can believe what you want, but no one opens that door, I said. He stared me down and I wondered if I'd be able to stop him if he tried. This is crazy. It could be dangerous out there. She might have had a phone that works. He said, wrapping an armor on Jenna. It is dangerous out there. That's why we don't open the door. I said. And Kyle started to say something but Aiden held up a hand. Em's right. We can't open the door. We don't know who's really out there. He said, standing. We need to eat. More time passed and we ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and drank the last of the milk before it went bad. 
Jenna only picked at her food, and she didn't drink her milk. Aiden hadn't spoken much. Even Kyle was quiet. He slept a lot, or at least pretended to. I continued to pray as my grandmother told me to do. Eventually, we all fell asleep. We had all awoken from our restless sleep sometime later by knocking. Not just knocking, but pounding. Someone, whoever pounded on our door, sounded terrified or angry, like they wanted to break the door down, like they were throwing their body into it. I briefly wondered if it was that same woman from before. In between the thundering on the door, there was a sound, something I struggled to hear, to isolate among noise. I thought that I almost had it, but the pounding stopped and with it, so did the sound. I don't know why, but that mysterious sound terrified me more than the hammering against the door did. Hello, is someone there? A man's voice. I know you are, he said, and somehow I knew that he was smiling when he had said it. There was an attack. Lots of people died. I'm going door to door to look for survivors to take them to safety, he said. Between each thing that he said, faintly was that sound again, and now I could make it out. Like something wet crawling up the sidewalk, wet hands, wet feet, slapping against the ground. I looked to the others to see if they had heard it, but I could see that they hadn't. They were listening to the man. They were believing the things that he said. They wanted to, I wanted to, but I held my grandmother's cross and knew that he was lying. If I leave, no telling how long you'll be in there then, and there may be more attacks to come, he said, and still he was smiling. And through each word, something continued to move towards us, something quiet and stealthy. That thing, that wet thing crawled ever closer, only moving when the man spoke using his words to cover the sound of its movement. Couldn't they hear it? All right then, I guess I'll be going. Wait, we're here, Jenna called out, jumping up from Kyle's mattress, nearly falling over her own feet. There was a pause and then an almost laugh, as if something that had never heard a laugh before but tried it anyway. That thing that inched closer to our door had laughed, but there was no humor in it. My stomach twisted. I felt dizzy. I grabbed my mattress for stability. Well, hello. I almost left you. How many of you are in there? He asked. What's your name? Jenna ran to the door. I reached out to stop her, but she ignored me. Four, where are you taking survivors? Do you know my father, Frank Mercer? She asked, her eyes twinkling in the candlelight. That's a lot of questions. I don't have time to go over them now. Not at the door like this. But there are many survivors left. Why don't you open the door and I'll take you to them, Jenna? He said. Was there a hint of annoyance in his voice? Aiden ran to Jenna and pulled her back away from the door. The man had said her name, despite no one telling him. But Jenna didn't notice or care. She kicked at Aiden's legs, but he was stronger. Stop! I want to see my dad! She screamed. Kyle and I tried to help, grabbing her arms and holding her down on the mattress. I'm going to leave, the man said. What hands? Moving faster now. Stop, babe. Please stop, Kyle whispered to her. She did stop then, laying still, panting, eyes still focused on the door. Aiden and I left Kyle to console her. The door was also our only focus. Leave. We're not going with you, Aiden said, his tone hard and stern. The man made a clucking sound with his tongue. Well, okay. If you change your mind, I'll be on the street checking houses for a bit, he said. A moment later, we heard the sound of him walking away, down the steps and down the walk past the thing that crawled towards our house. Did he see it? Jenna, you can't talk to them. They're lying. You have to wait for the sun to come up. I said, 
knowing how crazy it all sounded even to myself. For a split second, I wondered if I was wrong, if there really was a man out there looking for survivors. But I remembered the sound of him ramming into our door, the sound of him smiling, the way that he said Jenna's name, that wet thing. Just shut up, Em, she said, rolling under his side away from us. We let her be. As long as she was still, we didn't have to worry about her opening the door. Or so we thought. God, we were so stupid. So focused on the man on surviving on the dark that surrounded us that we forgot to watch Jenna. She had waited until Kyle and I fell asleep, until Aiden went to use the bathroom. I woke to the sound of the couch being dragged across the floor. By the time that I had opened my eyes, she was already unlocking the door. I screamed and hurriedly covered my eyes with my hands. I heard Kyle curse, stumbling up from his mattress. I heard Aiden running down the hall. Close your eyes, I screamed, and prayed that they had heard me. I heard Kyle shouting for Jenna, and the unmistakable sound of the door slamming open. Sir, Jenna's words were cut short. So fast, it was like someone had muted the world. I laid on my side, eyes squeezed tight and my hands pressed against them. And then I heard her screaming, a sound that I'll never forget. She screamed and screamed and screamed. And then she was laughing, laughing and screaming all at once and crying too. The sound of what hands were close now, even closer than Jenna's screams. It's ripping me, she screamed and laughed. It's taking it all out. Her voice had changed near the end, like something big crawling up her throat. The ripping, tearing, licking sounds were almost unbearable. Finally it stopped, those wet feet slapping against the sidewalk, dragging whatever was left of Jenna along with it, while she somehow still gurgled and giggled and cried. I was too afraid to move, but the thought of leaving that door wide open, the void and its inhabitants able to gaze in at us was worse. I was stealing myself to get up and close it when I heard someone moving towards it, and then the door slammed shut. Oh crap, Aiden yelled, breathing hard. Why didn't we watch her? I opened my eyes and saw my brother locking the door and dragging the couch back up against it. He fell against the wall panting, his eyes red and swollen. Kyle lay on the floor, his eyes shut tight, his hands over his ears. I sat up and reached out to touch him, but he recoiled away from me and began to scream, like a switch had been flipped. And we tried to calm him down, but what the heck do you tell someone who just heard their girlfriend being ripped apart by demons? It'll be okay. And we let him cry and scream for a while, maybe hours. Every once in a while, we would hear something knock on the door, on a window. Something wet, moving around the side of the house. Once we heard something laugh, low and demonic. And Kyle quieted eventually. It wasn't long after that that I heard a familiar sound. One that I had heard countless times. A melodic jiggling. A sound I knew well. I ran to my room and grabbed my phone off the floor by the closet. Somehow it had worked, but not for long. It went dead again in my hands the moment that I had picked it up. The screen flickering before going black. But it was enough for me to see my alarm had been going off. Long enough to know that we were in real trouble. That no matter how bad we thought it had been, it would get worse. Much worse. Because as I looked down at my now dead phone, I knew that somehow we had only been in the dark for one day. That meant we had two more to go. Two more days with that at our door and evil poised to knock. And somehow I knew that they would find a way to get in. Time, we learned, didn't work the same in this dark. It seemed to drag on forever. Every minute it seemed like an hour. An hour felt more like ten. We would sleep for what felt like hours, sometimes even longer, and yet we had no way of knowing. 
We were afraid to eat, afraid that we were eating too soon. We didn't want to run out, so we only ate when we felt truly starved. We couldn't trust the dead clocks or phones, so we decided to trust our bodies, hoping that it would know. Sleep didn't come easy for us. Instead of lessening as time went on, the noises outside only grew. Screams from terrified men, women, and yes, even children were never far from our ears. They died horribly, begging for help and in many cases, laughing too. As if it were so painful, so unbelievably agonizing, that their minds couldn't process it completely. And so they laughed as they died, while sometimes describing their horror to listening ears. We sat in the light of the candle, our only protection, crying and trying not to listen. And there were other sounds too, sounds that I still think about when I'm alone in my bed. Growls, but not from any earthly animal. Growls and laughter, maniac and wild, from the mouth of something almost human, but not. Something, many somethings in a fit of lunacy, gleeful and crazed as they ran through the streets. Delighted at the opportunity to be freely walking up here, with us. And they laughed as they attacked anyone unlucky enough to be outside. And when their victims cried in pain and begged for mercy, they laughed even more. There were quiet moments too, which somehow scared me more than the screams and frenzied laughter. Moments when the things outside went back to being stealthy, trying to sniff out their next victim, or try to lure them out if there were none to be found. And I tried to imagine what reasons a person would have for leaving their homes and stepping out into the void. I could find none. I couldn't fathom a cause to leave the safety of the candlelight. I would, of course, after it would all be over. I would talk to the other survivors and there I would hear of many who simply walked out into the black. For one reason or another. Most didn't even have a candle. Not a blessed one. For them, the dark was everywhere. To them, walking out wasn't a foolish decision. It was the only decision. I prayed a lot, sometimes out loud. I found it quieted the vicious giggles that lingered by our house. I prayed we could ride out the rest of the dark without going through another incident, without something coming out to the door again. But I think I knew that wasn't going to happen. I knew in my heart that something much worse was waiting out there for us. Something worse than the laughing things or the growling things. I somehow felt the wet thing that got Jenna was close and wanted to get in and would find a way in. Kyle worried me. He was quiet all the time and he hardly ate. Aiden was anxious, hardly able to sit still for very long. Spent most of his time pacing the hallway. I chose to stay as close to the candle as possible. Its warm light was my only security. During a quiet moment while my brother was pacing the hall, chewing his fingernails down until they bled, I went to sit on Kyle's mattress to talk with him. He had been staring at the ceiling for too long, refusing any food or water. I had a terrible feeling he was on the edge of madness. I didn't want to think about what that meant. I sat next to him and placed my hand on his chest. He still didn't take his eyes off the ceiling. I'm sorry about Jenna, I said, because I didn't know what else to say about it. I mean, what could I say? His eyelids fluttered for a second and refocused on the ceiling. Yeah, me too, he said. His voice sounded like a strange whisper, raw from the hours of screaming and crying, like someone who has gone too many days in the desert without water. We need you. You know that, don't you? I said. He did look at me then, turning at just his eyes. I know you're hurting, but promise me that you won't do anything stupid, I said. He exhaled a long breath, as if he had been holding it in for a long time. Maybe since Jenna ran out into the darkness with open arms. What, like run outside? He asked. His eyes were swimming in tears. 
Promise me, I said. He nodded and I laid his hand over mine and squeezed it. I think this stuff's gonna end anytime soon, he asked, forcing a smile. I don't know. Time passes so slowly now, but it will end, I know that, I said. We just have to stay inside and wait it out. He nodded again. I stayed with him like that with my hand on his chest and his hand on mine for a long time. Finally, I went to stand but he gripped my hand holding me there. She was pregnant, he said, so softly that I almost didn't hear it. The weight of his statement was uh, shocking enough, but then I remembered Jenna's last words, as the wet thing did whatever it did to her. How she screamed and laughed as it ripped her baby from her. I knew that's what it did, and I knew that Kyle knew it too. Had known it since the moment that she said the words. And I knew too that he would never be able to just grieve and recover. Not now. He would never be okay again. Looking at him, I think he knew that too. I felt a chill run through my body, through my bones. I tried not to picture it. Try not to imagine it there on the lawn in the pitch black. Something so ghastly smiling down at her while that ripped her wide open and took out her kid. But these thoughts ran through my brain anyway and I couldn't stop myself from crying. We cried together. For Jenna, for their baby. For every single person we had to hear die. And all the people that we wouldn't hear but would die. When Aiden found us like that, he didn't have to ask what was wrong or if we were okay. He knew the answer to both of these questions. We all lay together, holding one another while the world came down around us, or so it felt. I think I knew that it was coming even before I heard it. I think we all did. Footsteps, like bare feet on the front walk, walking slowly as if they were taking a peaceful stroll through the park. The footsteps stopped at the door, and a moment later there was a knock, three short raps. We didn't answer. We held each other tighter, willing it to go away. Three more short raps, just a bit louder than the first three. And then a voice, soft and sweet and not at all the voice that we had ever expected. Just three words were enough to nearly break us. Guys, it's me. She sounded so normal, like she had before. I think if she hadn't sounded so calm, so natural, I might have believed that it was her. But that wasn't Jenna. Guys, come on, open the door. She said again so calmly, as if she were just coming back from the store. Kyle sat up, staring at the door, eyes wild. I knew instantly that he would want to open it. Kyle, can you get the door? She asked, a touch of annoyance in her voice. Kyle, that's not Jenna. Aiden whispered, his hand gripping Kyle's shoulder. Kyle started to get up, but he stopped. He began to hyperventilate, his mouth hanging open, lips trembling. Kyle, babe, I need you to open the door. It's so dark out here, the voice said, soft and soothing. Kyle let out a strangled whimper, but he stayed on the bed, my brother's hand gripping his shoulder so tight that his knuckles were white. Kyle, you can't leave me alone out here, it said. And Kyle balled his fists and punched the mattress. No, he said and it sounded as if the words themselves were painful. Dang it, Kyle, the voice spat. You're such a screw-up. You can never do anything right. You couldn't even help me just once. The longer it spoke, the less like Jenna it sounded. A twisted mockery of her. But Kyle crumbled on the bed, sobbing. Aiden and I held him as best as we could, but he didn't make for the door, at least. You're a screw-up. A lazy degenerate. Can't even get up and open the door for the mother of your child. The voice was screaming. Jenna's voice almost totally gone. Stop. Please stop. Kyle begged. It did. For a moment. 
as if it realized it had slipped out of control, lost the facade that it needed to portray. You know, it said in Jenna's voice, I was going to leave you. I was. I knew you'd be a horrible father, but I felt sorry for you so I stayed. And look what it got me. It spoke softly again, as if it was saying anything else that might have been comforting. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, Kyle was saying, his head buried in the mattress. You are sorry. A sorry excuse for a man. And you always will be, it said. Go away, Aiden shouted, his body laying almost on top of Kyle. Just go back to where you came from. The voice was quiet for a long time. So long, I thought it had gone away. I allowed myself to feel relief and began to relax my body that had been so tense that it hurt. But that was short-lived. Kyle, open the door, it said. Do one thing right for me. No, Kyle, no. I whispered in his ear. He squeezed my hand, a sign that he had heard me. Kyle, do you want to know what it did to me? The voice asked, and I could hear its pleasure in saying those words. I sat up and moved in front of him, as if I could shield him from the words coming through the door. Stop! I screamed, but I knew that it would keep coming. It wouldn't stop until Kyle opened that door or was a broken heap on the floor. Oh, do you, Kyle? I know you've been wondering. Do you want to know what it did to me while you were hiding your eyes like a coward? It said. Kyle shook his head over and over, pleading with anything and nothing. No, he said again and again. It reached up inside me, Kyle, to a place you've never been. It almost felt good. It took a hold of our child. Did you know that it was a boy? It asked, clearly enjoying itself. God, Kyle whimpered. But the voice continued. It took all of him. And it keeps taking and taking and it'll take me to where it came from when this is all over. And it'll do things to me that the human mind can't even comprehend. And you know what? And paused, letting those poisonous words sink in. It will do it to our son too. For eternity. All because of you. And Kyle was sobbing, tears and snot streaked his face. And I thought that he would lose what sanity that he had left. Get the heck out of here, I screamed, throwing a plate at the door, letting it shatter. Oh, Emmy, our protector, it said, spitting the word out like rotten food. You think you know how to keep you safe, keep them safe, it laughed, a horrible sound that I could feel in my teeth. You're all gonna die in there, you just don't know it yet. It banged on the door like a hammer smashing into it and I thought for sure it would come crashing in. But it stopped, for whatever reason it did, and we were left alone with its words still hanging over us like an axe ready to fall. You gotta eat, I said later, trying for the umpteenth time to get Kyle to eat some crackers. How would you know, he said. He had decided to move his mattress back into his own bedroom, and he had been staying in there. We tried to talk him into staying with us near the candle, but he adamantly refused. He agreed to keep the door open at least, so some light would get in. Aiden thought that he just wanted to be closer to Jenna's things where they had slept together, but part of me wondered if he'd like to be in there, where the edges of the darkness reached out towards him like fingers. Just eat a few crackers, please, I said. I had out the half-empty pack and he took it. These are stale, he said, chewing one and making a face. Better than nothing, I said. Come back out in the living room, it's safer there. He shook his head, popping the last two crackers in his mouth and tossing the wrapper. He closed his eyes, trying to sleep or pretending to. I went to his door, making sure to leave it open wide enough to let the light in. They lie, you know, I said. He didn't respond, but I knew that he heard me. He should be out here with us, I told Aiden, sitting on the mattress. The light's stronger out here. He's a grown man. He can choose where he wants to be at, he said. He probably needs time alone. 
Well, that can come after. It's not safe to be alone. Not while it's still dark. He rubbed his eyes, sitting with his elbows on his knees. He looked so tired, it drained. He looked how I felt. When is this going to end? He asked. But I didn't think he was asking me. I put my arm around him and laid my head on his shoulder. I didn't have the answers. We fell asleep and when I woke, I almost forgot that Kyle had gone back to his room. I went to pop my head into his room just to make sure that he was okay. He was on his side, facing the wall. I thought about going over to make sure that he was alright, but I didn't want to bother him. I figured that he needed the time to mourn. He wasn't just mourning Jenna. He was mourning the loss of his child. His son, too. I used the bathroom and quickly washed my body with a washcloth and soap. I was too scared to get in the shower. The second that I stepped into the living room, there came a series of knocks on the front door. I froze. Aiden's eyes flew open and he sat up, looking for me. When he saw me, he relaxed a bit and motioned for me to come to him, a finger on his lips. I took a step towards him and it started again, like dozens of hands knocking at once. Emmy... I gasped. My mother, not really I knew, but her voice. Aiden and I exchanged a worried glance. Oh, sweetie, can you let me in? I quickly walked to the mattress and sat beside my brother, both of us trembling and holding on to each other. Aiden, open the door, it said firmly. We both knew that tone. My mother is a no-nonsense tone. And that tone used to get our butts in gear. But that wasn't our mother out there. It couldn't be our mother. We knew that it was coming. The anger, the cruelty, the lies. We were trying to prepare ourselves. Telling ourselves that it wasn't our mother out there. There was silence but for how long. The things in the dark never minded the wait. They enjoyed it. Relished it. Kids, your father's sick. He had a heart attack when the lights went out. It said, voice breaking, Mind to come and get you. He might, he might not make it. Aiden held me tighter and I pictured our father, grabbing his chest in a panic after having gone blind, or thinking he had. I pictured him grabbing for something to hold on to, stumbling for my mother, and hearing her own terror as he collapsed. Was he really dying? Or was he on a bed somewhere, his life slipping away in the dark as we refused to let in our own mother? She's not our mom, she's not here, Aiden whispered, as if he could hear my thoughts. He repeated these words like a mantra, whether they're for me or himself. Emmy, Aiden, open this door immediately. I don't have time for this. Your dad is very sick. It shouted, beating against the door. Just go away. Can't you see that we aren't going to open it? Aiden screamed. The knocking stopped and silence fell over us again, but we knew that it wasn't going to last. Aiden squeezed me tightly, almost enough to hurt, but I let him. It felt good, safe, like when I was seven and he was eight, and we were riding the horror attraction at the carnival for the first time. He was scared too, but he let me bury my face in his chest, his arms wrapped around me. I could hear his heart hammering now, just like I could hear it then on that rickety ride. But this wasn't an attraction. This was real. Do you really think that this door is enough to keep us out? The voice, it's a true voice, asked. If we truly wanted to come in, this piece of wood could not stop us. I couldn't tell if it was male or female. It sounded old, ancient, dead, like dry leaves. Aiden and I were shaking so much that my muscles ached. It shrieked with laughter behind the door, smashing into it once, twice, so many times that I lost count. And with every cracking of the wood, every groan of its weight on the hinges, it would shriek and howl with delight. It stopped just when I thought I couldn't stand another minute of it, but I knew that it lingered there, listening, waiting. Oh, say, it said teasingly, 
How many of you are in there? There seems to be one missing. You haven't checked on him in an awfully long time. I felt my heart seize and Aiden stiffened against me. He's okay, Em. It's just trying to scare us. Aiden whispered to me. I nodded that I understood. He's dead in that room, you know. You left him to die and you call yourselves a friend, it said. I jumped up, pushing away from the security of Aiden's embrace. He stood with me, reaching for my arms. I could hear him talking to me, telling me that Kyle was fine. But he followed me anyway. The sweat on his face and the fear in his eyes brained the confidence in his voice. We hurried down the hall, that awful cackling following us the whole way. From the doorway, I could see Kyle still laying on his side, facing the window that we had covered with a blanket. Kyle! Aiden called from the doorway. Y'all right? I waited for a reply for even just a shrug of his shoulders, but he was quiet still. I tried to swallow, but my tongue was so dry in my mouth. Was he breathing? I couldn't tell, not from the doorway. I took a step into the room. It felt cold, much colder than before. I forced myself to walk and I came around the bed and when I saw his face I knew that thing at the door was right. He was dead. His face was a slack pale, his parted lips already turning blue. Tears stung my eyes and I was somehow on my knees. Aiden was beside me, saying Kyle's name over and over in disbelief. How? When? I said shaking my head. Why? Kyle's eyes were glassy and wide, as if he had died as surprised or very afraid. I crawled to the bedside and touched his face. It was cold, hard. I told him that we loved him, that he was a good friend, that he would have been a great dad. Aiden hugged him and we both cried. It was a bad way to say goodbye to someone we had known and loved since we were in middle school. It wasn't hard to see how he had died. A shard of jagged glass was lodged into his throat, and the mattress beneath was drenched in red. The coppery smell hung heavy in the air. We were about to cover him with a sheet, but something didn't feel right. A question that was racing through my head. Where did he get the glass? I searched his room, tossing things around, pulling open drawers, his closet, ignoring my brother's worried questions. But I found nothing. Nothing broken. Nothing missing a piece of jagged glass. And then it clicked. The window. He had broken the window. I spun to face it, the blanket still hanging over it. I stepped up to it, slowly running my hands over the blanket, feeling for any broken section. I knew that it would be there even before I felt it. An empty piece, the size of a small dinner plate. What is it? Aiden asked. Our eyes met and without any words he knew. Oh my god, he said. He yanked me by my elbow, dragging me from the room. We could hear something laughing at the window as we tried to barricade the door with Aiden's dresser. I hated leaving Kyle alone in there in the dark, but we had no other choice. He had given the evil outside a way inside. Why had he done it? Why the window? I asked myself that question dozens of times as Aiden and I huddled together in the living room. I still ask it. Did he look outside? Did something make him do it? I couldn't imagine Kyle risking our lives unless he had no control over his actions. But what did I know? After he lost Jenna, Kyle lost a part of his mind, too. Aiden and I prayed together. We ate the rest of the crackers and Kyle was right. They were stale. We ate them anyway and tried to pretend that our friend wasn't dead in the next room. Try to forget that there was a broken window to the evil outside. We were trying to sleep when I heard the scratching. Fain at first and then louder until even Aiden heard it. We sat up as a noise came from the hallway. The sound of a dresser being moved away from the door. We were frozen there in the bed, waiting for something to walk around the corner, shambling towards us. We heard unsteady footsteps moving up the hall. 
Aiden grabbed my hand and I knew that he was thinking the same thing that I was. We were going to die here, in this house. There was nowhere to run. I thought of the woman that we heard screaming in the street, of Jenna, her laughter too. Would I die like that? Would I be in so much agony that I could only laugh? Would I have to listen to my brother laugh too? When the thing rounded the corner and stepped before us, framed by the candlelight, I couldn't help but scream. It looked at us and grinned, blue lips stretching impossibly wide. The shard of glass still jutted from his throat, pale skin stained red. Those glassy eyes watched us, dead eyes but still seen. He reached up and pulled the shard from his throat, the sound of tearing flesh unbearable. I was waiting for him to lunge at us, to attack us with the shard. But he stood it glaring at us with his dead eyes, accusingly. You let me die, they seemed to say. You let Jenna die, my child. He took a shuffling step closer, that grin betraying the hate in those eyes. The hysterical laughter was all around us then. There seemed to be hundreds of them outside, surrounding our house. Kyle, Aiden said, all color drained from his face. He almost looked like a corpse, like Kyle. Kyle, still smiling, reached for the candle and held it, his other hand still gripping the bloody shard that had killed him. He brought the candle to his face so that we could see just how empty his eyes looked, how dry and deathly pale his skin had become. And then, with grinning lips, he blew the candle out and let the darkness swallow us up.